my picture. Is 
gym there? Is that why? And we have, and I then we will do the allegiance, and I actually have a flag. Okay. Here. This is the proof that everybody has pants on. Okay. Now, wait a minute. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, justice for all. Okay. So, um, can we approve the minutes? If we're just, oh, minutes from July 21st, yes. Um, I need a approval uh, to approve the minutes. Or a, a Move to approve the minutes from July 21st. Second. Hey, there he is. Yeah. Well, I don't think. We're having some technical difficulties. Okay. Um. All right. So the so draft work plan. We wanted to finalize it, and we have <coughs> ourselves. And it seems like we have, to me, we have now five goals. For the year, I can't understand. And I'm not sure how to say the question to the staff. Ola, we can't hear you. You guys can hear. Let's try this. Let's put Jim on mute, and you can get you off mute. Try that. Okay. Okay. Jim, do you know how to put yourself on mute? Yeah. I think we made the vote on the motion. There you go. Paula, take yourself off mute now. You're on mute, Paula. I shouldn't be on mute. You know what? You don't even need to be on because you can be right here. Who's oh, the host uh, today? I'm turning it off all the time. I'm just, Renee, you just said it. He's here. He's here. Leave me together. Okay. 
Oh. What happened? Paul, it looks like Jim left the meeting and, and you're still on mute, so we can't hear you. If you're, right. Yeah, if you, if you could take yourself off of mute or if whoever's the host could take Paula off of mute. Okay. Now I don't have a live picture of Brenda either. So. Oh, she might have just turned off her camera. Okay. Nobody said this would be easy, so. <laughs> Paula, are you still on? We as humans are meant to come together. Paula, <laughs> well, that's not what that is. Okay. You're still on mute. We can't hear you. Hello, this is Kate from IT. We're going to need to unmute the device that Paula is using right now. She needs to unmute it. Should be in the bottom left corner of your screen. There. Oh, okay. There she is. Great. So I think we just need to vote on that motion to approve the minutes. Yes, let's vote on the motion to approve the minutes from July 21st. Can I get a, a, a first? I move to approve the minutes from the July 21st meeting. I think I I gave the motion, I totally seconded. I think we just need to vote. Yeah. I'll, I second it. All in favor of approving the minutes from July 21st? Hi. Uh, hi. <clears throat> okay. I'm still looking for Deputy Duran. I do not see him. If he does join, we will try to bring him in if we can. Um, back to the um, the work plan. Everybody has been has seen what um, the city's looking for. Um, we have. I think we have five categories. I don't know how specific they're going to be. Uh, although Burton gave some pretty good input um, yesterday. So the five categories I think they should be would be mental health, which is a continuation of last year. Mm -hmm. Homelessness, which is now Tyler and Bill, which we should keep on the agenda, but our, our plan is to um, appoint two committee members to the public safety task force. And I don't know any more than that's the plan and the goal are that particular organization's goal is to report back to us so we understand what's going on so it, so we can make recommendations to city council as we need to. Um, and we can get in more detail on that one. The third one would be the social service grants, which we'll talk in depth about. That has not changed at all from year to year. The process has not changed. Number four is the school, the high, this high school, which is sort of dead right now, but the process will continue when we're able to make contact. Right now, they're still getting kids registered for online, and, and no one has responded to me, and the, our, our contact is on maternity leave, and her contact, her replacement has not responded to us. So we're going to work hard on that. And then the fifth thing is I added, we I added myself, called food insecurity, um, but we, there's a lot of goals there, a lot of things that we can do. So, I don't know if that's too much. It's really not a whole lot more than we normally do. But let's go to, um, let's just start at the top and talk about mental health. The... Can I ask you a question about that list? Yes. Um, we talked briefly about adding coronavirus impacts on San Clemente. Is there a place for that or is that too outside of, I'm just thinking homelessness is going to show up there, food insecurity is going to show up there, so maybe it'll be woven through those things, but I think as like the case, oh, mental health. as the cases show up, as the business, small businesses are impacted, you know, school closures, all of those things, um, I'm just wondering what you think about including that as a topic or um, or not. Just a thought. I think it's great. I just want to know, is that a, they're called projects. So, and that's my question to Lisa and Janet. They're called projects. And they need to have purposes, goals, and deliverables. So, coronavirus impact is, is that's a, that's a, definitely a, a project. Can we have something like that? And then, basically, it's identifying 
areas of overlap or more likely areas of gaps. And maybe just coming up with a list of the impacts and what has changed in the city and how we can stay in front of this as much as possible. Well, it's part of the food insecurity. And it's part of safe food insecurity, but, what, but we've always had food insecurity and now we have a crisis. So the coronavirus impact is food, it's school, it's mental health, it's, it's a lot. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, it's fine with me. I mean, the more we work on, the better. Um, I'm just, well, I guess mm -hmm. my question again is to Lisa and to Janet. If we decide that a project is coronavirus impact assessment, Today, do we have to figure out all of the goals or can we just get your input on the project cost? Because the rest of it, we can, well, the project cost of the staff hours. <clears throat> and can we then, yeah. go ahead. Hi, this is Janet. Um, I don't see why that couldn't be listed as your work plan because it is an annual work plan. So it's what you're going to work on this year. And I think you could just put it like the mental health, homelessness, I think it could be a project if you'd like to, you know, to add that. I don't, if the council doesn't, um, you know, want it on there, I think that they would just let you know that, you know, because it's a draft work plan going to council for approval, so they would probably give you feedback. Okay, so it's a draft. So we can, we can come up with the five categories today and sign them out um, and work on them as long as we present it to you as a draft form on September 20th, and we don't need it to be blessed again by this group. We can bless the topics today and divvy out in groups of two or three so that it's all fleshed out and provided to City Council on September 20th. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And September 15th, and I think there's two weeks prior because it needs a staff report to accompany it and it would need to be on consent calendar. So really your your deadline is two weeks prior to September 15th that it would all need to, to be agendaized. Okay. So that's the first that gives us 20 days. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Paula, can, Paula, can I ask something here? Yeah. Yeah, well, where, where am I? I'm right here. Um, mental health just seems to be an awfully big, big topic. Is there a way that we can streamline that a bit? Or I think I wrote you a note about that saying. Indeed, and so did Burton. So I, I would like your input. Yes, Burton and you both wrote. Yeah, I, guess, I guess my question was whether whether we're talking about inventorying uh, what services are available or um, what aspect of mental health are we really looking at, because that's an awfully big topic by itself. Yes, it is. Burton? Yeah. Paul, <laughs> well, if I could make a suggestion. Uh, on this particular item in, as part of our work plan, um, it seems to be kind of in alignment with uh, what, what you had put together in the original work plan that we, that we kind of drafted on our own, which is that you plan on having somebody come and speak at, at our meetings each time on a different subject. And, uh, and I know that's why we have Susan from the Wellness and Prevention Center here t today. Um, it seems like maybe the, the actual project for this aspect of our work plan would be having presentations at each of our meetings based on topics, you know, that are, that we see as, um, as needed topics to discuss in the community. And then within that project item, just a single project item for presentations, we could list out, you know, if we have six meetings a year, we could list out the six we've already, you know, had one, so five more, what have you. Um, and that way it's all kind of housed in, in one project because um, they're all kind of the same. And, and from there, we may be able to modify our goals if we have a presentation, like for mental health, for example, if we, if we decide we want to have um, some sort of forum or event or something in the future, maybe once, once um, COVID starts um, you know, dying down, I suppose we could talk about that if maybe for our next work plan. I'm just suggesting that we just have one project topic for all the presentations. So the, the project would be presentations, not mental health. The project would be yeah. presentations per meeting. That's the project? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure if we'd be able to come up with a, a project specifically for mental health right now. I know we were working previously on um, the community forum uh, with 
Susan and the Wellness Prevention Center, and that had to be canceled because of COVID-19. So I'm not sure if we'd be able to even start planning something like that. Now, that's the only thing I can think of that we would do yeah. for that topic. Um, and so given the absence of the ability to do much about it outwardly, you know, just I think it seems like the project is actually having speakers come to speak with us. Yeah, they could speak on different aspects of mental health. Like Susan's here, that would be adolescents or high school age and the mental health issue that they deal with. Right, and we Good have idea, Tyler. Here too talking about suicide prevention. We also have Find Your Anchor. They'll be that's part of that's part of wellness and prevention. Yes. Okay. It it would seem to me that that the the presentation doesn't need to be the project. We could still have a project even if we can't realize the project necessarily because of COVID restrictions. That that wouldn't necessarily inhibit us from having the project, planning the project. Um, creating the outline, creating, you know, what exactly we're going to be doing. If it is a community forum, who are we going to have? How can we engage that? We could still do all of the groundwork in terms of realizing the project, understanding that the project is not going to realize until restrictions are lifted. Um, so I don't, I don't see where having speakers come in is so much a project. Um, I don't see where that's so much a project. It seems like that's just what we're going mm -hmm. to do anyway. Yeah, and, and I think, I, I agree with you, Bert, and I think, I think you're right. I think if, if we do, let's say, want to kind of rehash the idea of having a community forum on mental health, it does seem like that would be one project item. Um, but in, in the effort of letting the council know what it is we're doing at our mm -hmm. meeting throughout the year, I, I would still say that the presentations is something okay. important that's, that's listed for the council to see as part of our work plan. So I'd say mm -hmm. presentations being one project and list out the topics that we've laid out and then maybe have a separate project topic for a mental wellness community forum. I've also got one for the virus impact assessment. So I've got three so far. And okay. we all okay, cool. Just saying, it's it's more clear to me now. I was imagining that a project was going to be an actionable item that we were going to achieve for the community. That's how I was understanding project. Sure. So yeah. yes, and I understand more now with what you said. What are our yeah. many, like our goal our ultimate goal is where we were back in trying to achieve in May. Yeah, I think it's all important to all of us to get that out there, even if it's next May, that at some point in the future. And then these other parts, the presenters are just steps to that eventual accomplishment. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm seeing. Yeah. Does that make sense? Um, not entirely, Jim. You're going to have to move a little bit closer or move into screen at the camera okay. when you're talking. Right. It's be easier. You look like a talking hand. Yeah, sorry yeah. about that. Um, can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, much better. Sure. Okay. Once again, I think our overall project is that community forum, whenever that may be uh, in the future, because that we've put so much time, energy, and effort into that. We all have an interest in it. Uh, it affects all of us. Second part to meet that would be our community resources that we've talked about. And then um, getting to know all that better before we even have the forum, right? Yeah, that's good. So, and from going back to it, young people, which would be school-aged, uh, teenagers, people, uh, parents, like parent-to-parent uh, -parent strategies has. Then we're looking at the uh, elderly people. So we, we're doing what we do uh, or have an interest in all the time, from uh, before they're born to the day they die. Everybody across the spectrum. Um, that's kind of how I, that's kind of how I see it. You know, so I still feel that, that the community forum uh, eventually is very important getting what we know out to the public because if we don't know it they don't know it mm -hmm. right yeah. yeah that sounds good yeah, yeah we agree <laughs> yeah I agree also um... good job so the, the, again so the project okay so the project is the community forum Another, but part of the whole thing is the presentations, the awareness of, of what's going on in the city, that all this awareness that feeds all of 
a project, such as the impact assessment, which could be food, it could be health, it could be a lot of things. Move closer, Paula. Can't hear you. Okay. Really? Okay. I said that what I, what I see so far is the Mental Health Community Forum is a project. The presentations are Part. subject matter that is this is understanding and awareness of all of the things that we're working on as a group. So the presentations are not necessarily a project, they are just a an ongoing goal that we have. Not yeah, and if I could add that I think what we're trying to do here is sort of fit a round peg into a square hole um, with <laughs> the way that the work plan has been drafted, whoever drafted it. And so, you know, I think the goal really is to let the council know what we're doing. And so the, the presentations at our meetings, I think, is an important thing for us to, to make mention of in, a, in this work plan so that they know what we're doing. And if it's, if it's not technically, quote, unquote, a project, I think it's, we could still put it down there. And then, you know, thinking about where this will go in the future, we've got, let's say, one project is presentations. And we've got, you know, presentation topic for each meeting. And then another project is community forum on X topic. And every year when we redraft our work plan, we can use all the presentations we've we've seen from the previous year to figure out which topic we want to go in the community forum. Got it. That's, yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. That's good, yeah. Good. Okay. So then, um, okay, the impact assessment, will that will just sort of new and we'll have to flush that out as we go along. Um, number where I get the social service grants. Let's go to the high school. I told you the high school will be the same as it always was with the addition that, well, I'm not sure how they're going to do it today, but basically a, a sample, about five or six juniors slash seniors that are doing humanitarian work in the city, in the county, in the state, maybe in the world are identified. And maybe one gets an award if there's face-to-face -face contact. Um, but we stick with them and we, we mentor them. So things are a little bit different now. We're not going to have meetings. We're not. They could get an award, um, but they're not going to get the handshake. So I don't think it's really changed any. The, the, the way that we're going to handle it will be based on the, the social distancing and the coronavirus. So I think that project is the same as it's always been. Um, so I'm not going to really, we'll, we'll flesh that out. And then the last one is the social services grants. And as far as I'm concerned, the process is fine. We've been doing it the same way for the past few years. So you know, identify, they have grants, we visit them, mm -hmm. they apply for the grants, we discuss the grants, we recommend funding. Whether it gets funded or not, we have no control over that. But the process has always been the same. So I don't think that that has changed. What I do want to do, though, is I want to assign out these five sections to different people. Um, but now my question, again, back to Janet and Lisa, do we have to come up with this, this format? with how, how much staff hours, the timeline, which that's pretty simple. Project cost, I have no idea. So how do we do that part? Your question is for which which yeah, project? How do we know what the project cost is going to be or the resources? Um, we would probably have to, at some point have to ask staff what, the, they, what they think the resources, resources are going to be. Because it's in here, we have to have to give them staff hours. So um, that was my question to Jana and Lisa. Can we flesh this whole thing out without estimating the cost and the hours? And then you can help us with that. Well, I can see. It, it seems to me that that sounds fair and, and um, feasible and, and uh, also the um, social service grants uh, approval is something that um, has you know taken a certain amount of staff time in preparation for our kind of approval meeting and, and then the meeting itself. Um, and, and outside of that, I think it's kind of our own time, which we wouldn't necessarily need to account for. Um, the presentations in our meetings would be during during the meeting, so it's already allocated as staff time, and uh, and and I guess the community work plan is something that would be the question of what what are the resources and time and money. 
Okay. And I think, yeah, so I don't think it's that big of a deal if, if we don't have specific information. But what I wanted to do was assign out these five for you guys to come up with some bullet points that we could then add to the work plan and then present it. And we would need it back by the first, September 1st. Um, so the coronavirus impact assessment, who wants to sort of flesh that out? Brenda? Mm -hmm. You want to help me with that one? You're on mute, Brenda. That's a yes, okay. Yes, yeah, so I guess what I, I, I want to like, what does it mean to, like, what, what is it going to be, what are we trying to figure out? Obviously, just like how we're going to get the information. Like, I don't even know what resource, for any of them, you know, what resources are at our disposal? Is that completely up to us? If we were going to do with some sort of coronavirus impact assessment, do we, who do we ask? That's what I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, I read a lot about the county, but I don't know what's really going on in the city as far as the coronavirus. I know that there's a testing site at the, at the hospital, but I don't think it's open. So I don't know the answer either. Um, as yeah, they, the San Clemente Times has started posting coronavirus cases in San Clemente. I don't know where that information is coming from. Maybe we could get that data. It's been in the, um, it's been in the OC register every single day. OCHealth.org has it every single day. They've been yeah. posting it since April. But that's it, just pieces. We could at least, you know, begin the the uh, research. Yeah. You know, we need to talk about housing and... Where does the data come from? Is we need data. Yeah. Where does the data come from? Um, what data are we looking for? Okay. Brenda, you and I will work on this one. And we'll just come up with, with a few things that we would like to just keep in front of the city. Because okay. if it is an impact to the coronavirus, it's going to hit the, the organizations that we fund in the first place. So. It's going to be tied very closely with homelessness and food insecurity. So, Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, the second one was the Mental Health Forum. That is a, a project that we didn't finish. So who mm -hmm. wants to work on that one? I'd be happy to work on that one. Anybody else? And is that, just to clarify though, is, is that... Um, are we talking about the presentation topics and doing no, the forum? The presentation topics, that's just going to be one where, well, that's the, that's the third one. The first, second one was the mental health forum, just re getting it going again. When can we have it? Or how, if we can't have it face to face, having it virtual. And if we have it virtual, how's it going to work? That whole thing. That's okay. we're going to do it. So we might as well just figure out how we're going to do it now. Who was, yeah, who was doing? Tyler, what, uh, who was with you on the forum before? Who was with you? Uh, we were working on a forum before. We had our little parts, and then, like we did with the one before, right? We had a date, and we had a we site. Had, right, and, and we had people working on it, getting it organized. Um, who are those people? Um, from what I recall, it was Paula and I that had um, been working with Susan and Lauren at the Wellness and Prevention Center, and 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 frankly, we were kind of riding on the coattails of, of Susan and Lauren, and they were doing a lot of the legwork to, to put it together, and then um, and then we had to cancel it. So that's probably what I would do is is uh, of course you know bring Paula into what I'm doing or anybody else that's interested, um, as long as there's not more than three of us, and and uh, we we'll just re-engage those conversations and see what seems to make sense about when and how to have it. Why, why don't I jump in on that one? So, cool. uh, yeah, I'll jump in on the on the mental health. Keep it, yeah. Um, so that eventually it will will happen. So, um, awesome. Then the third one is is the ongoing presentation. So we have to figure out. We have what five more meetings. We're now in August, so we'll have two more. Yeah, we'll probably have five more meetings. So it, yeah, make, making sure that the presentation is um, applicable to what's going on. Um, and that's, that's I can write that, that's that we have, that we just make sure that we have the right people here to, to educate us. And sometimes on things we don't know about, like that's why Morgan's here. So we'll, I'll, I'll work on that one. If anybody else wants to, that's fine. Um, number four is the high school, I'm asking. <laughs> Toby. 
Do you want to flesh this sure. out? I mean, it's pretty much the same as we've always done, Tokyo. Yeah. I want yeah. you to get in touch. We, I've been trying to get in touch with the high school. They've given us yeah. phone calls, but they're pretty busy right now. Is so, Susan is Susan here, right? Is she on? Susan's here, yes. Okay, well, she'll I'm tell here. you about it. Yeah. The, um, do you want a quick update on what's going on at the school? Yes. Okay, so... Um, they're all, so what's happening is they have to adapt since it's going to be 100% online. They're adapting to completely new curriculums and a completely new platform. Um, you know, one, it's, it's, it's a big learning curve for the families and for the staff. Um, so right now, you're not going to, you, I wouldn't even think about asking for anything from high school staff probably until, um, probably until late September. It's going to be a really, it's going to be a rough start. And it's, you know, it's not the way anyone wanted it to be. And um, it's it's just hard on families. It's hard on the, the administration and it's hard on the teachers because they're not even, they have to all adopt this new online curriculum. They're not even teaching the way they taught before. So, um, so I wouldn't even bother trying to get anyone's attention at the school right now. Okay. And as far as mentoring, I guess we were hoping, well, I was hoping that these kids are still going to apply to college. And yeah, and there's still like our our youth group is still meeting and doing things virtually. Um, there's there's definitely a lot of clubs still happening, but again, I would just kind of hold off till this this adjust this whole okay. adjustment gets started. Yeah, good advice. Okay. That's what I meant. Okay, so we'll just we'll just pretty much keep it the way it was, and based on the, how the how things go, we'll still our goals are still the same. So okay. Um, and then the last one is the social services grants. Um. Yeah, one thing on that, I, I uh, had a conversation with Cecilia this morning about the social services grants, and um, I know we have this agendized later on our agenda for today, but um, in, in discussing the uh, social ser services grants not being funded this year for 2021, um, she suggested that we actually include whatever work we want to do on that into our work plan. So if we do want to reach out to these organizations to find out what the impact is of not having this funding, um, she, she suggested that we include that into our work plan as a separate project than our other 21-22 social service grant funding. Okay, so. I got that. So the, the impact, and we're gonna talk about that today, okay. Um, okay. Um, I can work on that too. Yeah, and, and um, you know, the reason I agendized it, and I know we'll talk about it later, um, but was so that we could kind of survey those organizations and get feedback from them on um, how not having this funding would, would impact them and, and, uh, and, then and then ultimately make some recommendation to the council. Um, and so I know that's, that's pretty time sensitive uh, if this is going to the council September 15th, uh, you know, we're getting into the time frame where we're asking, where the city would generally be asking people mm -hmm. to submit applications for the following year social service grants before uh, it would be, you know, um, before we'd have any surveys out or anything. So I think that's kind of part of our conversation later. But right, uh, and I have to, we have some letters that are some emails that are coming in during this the next period. But during this next agenda item, we have uh, emails from two organizations about the impact to their specific organizations and what's, what, what the lack of funding is going to be. So, um, yes. Um, and there's one more thing I wanted, well, I wanted to do. I did have a discussion with another organization, another committee yesterday, as far as the food insecurity issue and being the granola person that I am, <laughs> I was thinking about developing a community garden where you know, people could come, kids, parents, those who cannot grow any kind of food on their balcony, in their backyard, then you might not even have a balcony, you might not even have a yard, um, but wanted to grow something sustainable, especially during um, food insecurity. There's going to be a lot more of it coming up. I thought we could organize or promote a community garden, but it turns out that Parks and Recreation um, knows about lots of them. There's one at Shorecliffs, there's one at Bernice Ayers, there may be others. Um, they have discussed it before. 
Um, they were thinking it had to be city property. I don't think it needs to be city property. I think it could be any property that anybody wants to donate. And I don't think it could be any more than 500 square feet, maybe a thousand square feet. But I don't know whether it belongs to human affairs. I think it might belong in, park, in, in parks and recreation. But I do think that over the long term, that we should identify, just identify that as something else as part of food insecurity, that people can learn to grow what, some kind of sustainable food that they don't just, I mean, I know I go to my backyard every day and get tomatoes and eat them as my breakfast. So um, little stuff like that. But I don't, again, it may not belong in human affairs and it is being discussed at a lot of the other organizations in town. So I think we're okay on that. <laughs> It could be, uh, I, I mean, I'd be very interested to hear more about that and yeah. maybe even have a meeting topic around that or something. There are docents out there. They can teach. I mean, if you have a patio, how do you make a container? What, where do you put it? What kind of bugs do you get? What can you expect? How does climate change and the sun or the where you face mean to growing things? What grows here? Things are different now than when I moved here 30 years ago. Right. Very different. So... I just thought it would be something sort of fun too, um, and educational that most of us don't know that much about. I can I can volunteer my wife on that one. Oh, cool! All right, I think that is be... a great. See, there you go. We have we have tomatoes. We have su supplied about fifteen neighbors with our little tomato thing. She. Yep, she's I think that's wonderful. She's a farmer at heart. Yeah, cool. Yeah. 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 Okay. The opposite of food, the opposite of food insecurities, food securities. Yes. Banana fish, same yeah. thing, same thing. One saving the world, one plant at a time. I don't know. Exactly. Right. One tomato at a time. One tomato at a time. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. All right. So I will um, send something out to you guys. Um, I may just send something out that unsolicited to you to get your input anyway. Um, but I've got like seven things now. I have the impact assessment. I have mental health community forum. I have ongoing presentations, uh, which could be the community garden, could be one of those, um, or which could be the food insecurity. Um, I have at the high school, which is on hold right now. I have social services grants just in general, and I have the impact of the non-funding of the social services grant. So that's six. Community Garden goes up into the presentation and food and security. Okay. All right. We will get something together that we can have. We need it two weeks prior to 9.15. So that's 9.1, whatever day of the week that is. Okay. So I don't think we have to vote on that. I'm hoping. Okay. So the next is the, the next is new business and the education of mental health. Um, we have Susan and we have Morgan. So Susan, do you want to present first? And I guess you coordinated your presentation with staff. Um, I'm not, I don't have anything visual. I thought I'd keep it a little more open, kind of talking about what what kind of things we're seeing in the community, what kind of things we're seeing nationwide, um, and what what some of the major concerns are among those of us who, who treat youth and um, and their families. Does that sound like a good idea? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, so one thing that's happened is a lot of, as people become isolated, we're, we're, we're kind of witnessing this loss of connectivity um, where where we do know it's it, in some cases it's leading, we've seen an uptick in overdoses and we don't have a lot of numbers on um, death by suicide. I don't know if Morgan does when it's her turn. Um, but what we're worried about is that people aren't accessing the services at the same level that they were accessing them prior to this. People aren't familiar with telehealth. Um, they don't really understand how that works. We maintained a, a pretty even caseload throughout this. Um, but it was the kids that you know we were most worried about when school closed that kind of fell off a lot of our radar. Um, so what we're seeing is we're seeing kids at first they got home and they were you know excited I don't have to go to school and then they kind of had a loss of structure in what they were doing. Then we're, we're seeing a lot of disturbed sleep patterns. 
Um, and now we're just getting a general sense of anxiety about how, what school is going to look like when we reopen. Unfortunately, um, there has not been yet a lot of communication from the district. A lot of the information that I gave you has come because I have a few administrators that are friends that have updated me about what they're experiencing and kind of their own stress. Um, so, you know, the minute we, the kids are starting to learn now that even though it's going to be distance learning, but they're going to have to wake up at eight o'clock and log into every single class during the day. Now they're starting to really get a, get a little worried about how they're even going to deal with that because their schedules are so maladjusted now. And we saw a lot of kids who just couldn't motivate to do this online learning. Um, so a lot of the biggest concerns are um, learning loss and then a high level of anxiety um, and then we're seeing some kids who are sh starting to show more symptoms of depression, mainly because they're not connecting their friends. Um, so some of the things that we've been working on is trying to set up more group focused um, interventions. So we're trying to get a bunch of kids together so that they have some connectivity. Um, this is, we do this on Zoom. Um, not surprising, kids are really good on Zoom. Um, and they, they don't seem to have the same mute problems we have and stuff like that. Um, and, um, and we're also trying to make sure we reconnect with all the school counselors before this school year started. We didn't have a good, as good a setup as we would have liked to have going into this situation so fast. So I do know the school district also is setting up new protocols for checking in with students. Um, through distance learning, um, several of all the school counselors I spoke to um, will be working with us um, to figure out how to best serve the youth too so that we make transitions to our services as easy as possible. Um, we're also seeing more adults than we've seen before just because th there is a lot of uncertainty out there and we have a lot of adults who've reached out for services and a lot of them are having trouble with housing and food. So. Um, Obviously, it's all intertwined, as you guys all pointed out earlier. Um, so those are, that's kind of in it in a nutshell. What I wanted to see, too, is what kind of questions you guys had for me today. How, how do you find out about the ones that you wouldn't have, if they, how are you reaching out? If they don't know you exist? You... Um, so we have been, we've been actively, um, at, so Picket Fence, Picket Fence Media gets a space in the paper, so we've been making sure people know we're, we're out there virtually. All the school counselors know we're out there virtually, and we still maintain a um, bi-weekly e-news that goes, a bi-monthly e-news that goes out to over 5,000 homes. So everyone's aware that we're seeing people right now. Um, what I worry about is the family that's not reaching out because a lot of times kids would just walk into our office and ask us for help and say, you know, my parents don't really believe in mental health. They're not getting the access to services. Those are the kids I really worry about because often they were just told by a friend, hey, go, go over to the Wellness and Prevention Center office and, and talk to somebody. Um, those are the kids I'm really worried about because they weren't accessing services before. Um, this is why I think the district's looking at ways um, – to really have have their school counselors do more checks. And then once if the school counselors know it's something that we might be better situated for, then it'll get bounced over to us from the school counselors. But I'm, I'm very worried about the kids we're not catching. We're seeing a much lower rate of um, reports for child abuse as well, and that's terribly scary because teachers and school staff, um, they put in about 40% of the referrals to those um, agencies. So um, those are the things that the a practitioner, um, a mental health practitioner for youth, those are the things that I'm really worried about. Hey, Susan, I have a question for you. Yeah. Glad you're here. Um, Thanks. So how how young are you being able to reach out to these kids? Because now, right, you know, what I'm thinking about now is uh, for a lot of parents, uh, school was uh, the way they got to go to work. Right. Uh, like elementary school and are, are you available to the parents of those kids or how are those kids being managed in terms of if the parents are gone and they have to be schooling on their own um, it's just so like um, the way we the only organization that we work through for that we don't work with the elementary schools we are working with the boys and girls club the boys and girls club will be open all day during the school year this year and they're working their their primary um, they I don't know if they're opening beyond essential workers or not, but they will be helping those kids with schooling. Um, definitely this is a concern because those are kids are going to have more learning loss because they don't have 
someone there to help them learn. I mean, some houses, I'm sure it's an older sibling that's trying to both do their school and help the little ones, and that's obviously not the best situation. Um, again, the district is trying to identify those households and figure out some measures to help with that. So we do get referrals from Boys and Girls Club, but we are not working with um, with elementary school staff. Our resource in town for ele elementary school age children is Child Guidance Center. They came in last year. Um, so it might be worth um, seeing if, if they have a way to do outreach to the younger group. What about technology and access to technology? Because, you know, again, a lot of these people might have one device for the whole family to share and everybody's... Right. So the, the district is, um, anyone who wants a Chromebook in the entire district is to get one now. So um, a lot of them got them at the end of last year and they were not required to turn them in. Um, and then it was, the announcement was made that anyone who wants a Chromebook can pick one up. I don't know how that system works, um, but it has been announced to the families that there's a Chromebook for any child who wants one now. I'm not sure about internet connectivity. That's another issue because I don't even, my Zoom calls drop at my house. So I'm not sure how that works when you have like three kids logged into it at the same time. Are they doing any kind of supervised presence for the kids at the school? Like those who need inter like internet or something like that or if they're socially distanced at the library? As of now, no, because of the um, orders to not have kids in a public space. So not that I'm aware of Boys and Girls Clubs probably, well, I know why has been having their their programs open. Those are a little less affordable for our families, but um, honestly, Boys and Girls Club is picking up a big burden right now. So I do suggest, you know, making that, making, giving them a donation right now because they're the kids they're seeing are not, they're not paying dues. I know that. Um, so there is, there's, we are missing a safety net for some of these kids right now, for sure. Is it is the is your office open at all? Um, we are probably going to open for limited hours because we have the back patio. No one's really yeah. asked yet. So far, our caseload's been pretty happy with um, with telehealth. But um, because of some of our at-home situations, we're looking more at opening um, up so that some of our staff has room to work. And if people want an in-person appointment, um, we have been given the go-ahead to be open because we're up above the school and we can have whoever we want in during the day now. Okay, good. And I was going to say, I know you mentioned earlier that there's, uh, you know, there's an increase in, uh, in overdose and suicide. We don't have hard numbers on that. What, um, what are you finding to be the real impact of the lack of socialization for children, knowing that um, socialization of children is so important to their uh, their mental development? What uh, kind of what what kind of things are you seeing, and do you have any recommendations? Um, because I know the telehealth is is. It's a nice option for somebody who just needs to actually talk about something, but that's still not uh, socialization. It's still not actually creating bonding connection between right. individuals. What, what I've I, seen that, that's, that's something that's, that's very important to me, and uh, it really tears at my heart. So I'm kind of curious, you as a professional, what? Yeah, what, what, you, what I've what seen recommend? is I've I've seen, and I do recommend this families that are kind of quarantining. They're quarantining as groups together. So that means that the, the cul-de-sac below me, they're all pretty much elementary school age kids. There must be about eight of them. I think those families have made some kind of arrangement because those kids are running around and playing and and and, and enjoying themselves and making a lot of noise. Our, our neighbors with young kids, um, young elementary school kids, okay. I've noticed that they've had the same cohort of friends every once in a while. So at least they're getting some small group play. Yeah. Um, so we are seeing families do that because there's just, they're fatigued in it. They're all agreeing on kind of the same roles. I think that's a really healthy way to do it. We have a lot of high schoolers who really need the socialization and really are not following the rules. Um, I mean, just go down to the beach any day of the week. Um, you'll see a lot of non, you know, unrelated groups of people, especially young kids. I mean, so far we haven't, I haven't heard of anything super detrimental about that. And, um, you know, in, uh, you know, some parents have not, made their teens stay home and I, I don't know if I still have teens which way I go with that one to be honest um, so the socialization I agree is still really important which is um, which is why I think they're going to look at more you know pulling kids into groups on the computer screen which it really isn't equal but I will say you know a lot of kids socialize through video games and um, and they're perfectly happy socializing that way and I think it's right now it's 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 the best we can do so some of these 
some of these modifications that are happening, I think, are really positive to the socialization for kids right now. I've got a question on how closely do you work with COA? Like, um, we do a, we do a lot of coordinating. We do a lot of prevention education with COA. So we did a series at the end of the school year called um, Quarantine. Oh, I can't remember the exact name. They were doing a, three virtual meetings a week. Um, some of it was games. They had a big kind of festival in the end with a comedian. Um, so Lauren, um, my prevention specialist, she does she does that kind of work with COA, and, and, and we really enjoy working with them. Hey, Susan, uh, it sounds like you're, you've got a pretty full workload with referrals and whatnot um, from the school and the Boys and Girls Club and others, but for anyone that happens to be tuning in right now, what would be the best way to reach out to you in the Wellness and Prevention Center if they're... Um, they can use our email um, or, or just my phone number. So that's what's on most things. So um, our main number is 949-680-0516. And then we have an email that is info at www.wpc-oc.org. And that's the way we, I mean, that's the best way to reach us and to schedule an appointment. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I just wanted to say, um, this is not for no, nonprofits, but um, one of my customers is KinderCare, and they've changed their model 100%. Um, they yeah. used to put in for school called Champions, and now it's all the time. So kinder care used to be just for little ones all day long so the parents could go to work, but now kinder care is um, taking in the older ones because no one can, the schools are now in, in phases, Monday, Tuesday, or morning, afternoon, so kinder care is now taking older children all day long. So right. of that's, people have to pay for that, but it's sort of the same thing that you were talking about with a why. So. Yeah, and then, you know, I've encouraged some, some kids have decided to not go to school because they don't want to go. They, they've decided to put a year off before college. You know, I'm kind of encouraging them to see if you want to lead some learning pods for parents, you know, that you make some good money. So um, that's another thing I think some of these kind of resourceful young young people are going to do. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you guys and all the work you do advocating for the social services in town. And um, thanks for letting me present. So um, if you have any other questions, I'm going to stay on, but I know, I know Morgan's here too today. Okay, Morgan. Thanks for contacting me. You're on. This all new. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. I'm here with Allie, our founder, as well. Hi. Thank you for having us. Um, so, just a really quick kind of summary. We were just going to generally talk about Find Your Anchor, the nonprofit we run. We have a short video to show you guys. Um, and then talk generally, and then maybe more specifically about what we could do in San Clemente. So Tara, if you wouldn't mind going ahead and playing the video. Just give me one second. Maybe you've read about this. Maybe you didn't have to read about it because it's already hit too close to home. But you should know the world is suffering from an epidemic of suicide. In the United States alone, the number of people taking their own lives has increased 25% since 1999. Globally, this epidemic cost us almost 800,000 of our mothers, brothers, spouses, children, heroes, and fellow humans every year. And each one of those people had their own story. But there's a consistent theme I've heard over and over. A feeling of being alone and unseen in the middle of an increasingly distracted and disconnected society. Stories about standing in a park or on a bridge, just waiting for someone to say hello. For just one smile from a stranger to prove to themselves that their existence matters. When you're suffering, it can really be something that small. Acknowledge me, smile at me, and I won't kill myself. What they need is something to grab onto, something to hold themselves in place. That's why I created Find Your Anchor. It's not a program or a hotline. It's something real you can hold in your hand. 
and inside are items designed to give hope, validation, and maybe a smile to the person who finds it. A letter, a poster, a deck of cards full of ideas and experiences that help anchor us to our lives. We launch these boxes into the world one at a time. People in need find them and take them home. They keep them as long as they like. When they're ready, they add something of their own to the box and launch it for someone else to find. So far, we've launched thousands of boxes in every state and over 35 countries. We've established partnerships with other groups dedicated to suicide prevention. And we've created custom blue boxes for partners in the military and education. We want a box on every college campus, on the desk of every congressperson, and in the hands of every veteran who suffers from suicidal thoughts. And you can help. A $25 donation covers the printing, materials, and assembly of one box. And we are looking for additional partnerships to help expand our mission of helping people establish an anchor. A dependable, stable, secure base they can hold on to, no matter what storms may come. Our world is full of big problems. An epidemic of hopelessness is among the biggest. I don't know how to make it go away, but I know these boxes help. All by themselves, they're quite small, but they open up to reveal something huge, and perhaps the only thing with the power to make a real difference. Humanity. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Um, so we have a short presentation just to kind of elaborate a little bit more on that. Um, Tara, if you wouldn't mind, I think we could probably start on the third slide. Sure, I'll pull it up. Thank you. I have it on the slide. It says problem at the top. And that one, perfect. Um, so what you're looking at here, um, we are experiencing what we consider an epidemic of hopelessness. Um, the numbers you heard in the movie are from 2018. Um, so I just wanted to let you know, uh, 2019, the numbers just aren't getting better. We lost over 48,000 people to suicide, and we suffered a staggering 1.4 million attempts. Um, so unfortunately, it's a, it's a prevalent problem, and, and COVID is only exacerbating this right now. Um, next slide, please, sir. The next slide is up. So I created this because I've personally struggled. I survived multiple suicide attempts. And everything that I encountered in the mental health world just felt super sterile and corporate. And I couldn't find anything that really resonated with me. Um, so I thought, you know, if I can't find it, odds are that a lot of other people can't as well. So I'm going to create it. I'm a graphic designer. I'm going to, I'm going to do it myself. Uh, in the, in the height of my darkness, my fundamental core belief was that nobody would care. I couldn't feel the love that I was surrounded by and the support, um, and I thought if I could create something that showed you that strangers care about you, then maybe it won't be so hard to believe that your friends and family do as well. So with Find Your Anchor, we're all about building this network and community of strangers who care. You can go to the next slide, please, Tara. Sure. Thank you. So I created Find Your Anchor. Uh, Find Your Anchor, as you saw in the, in the uh, video, is this little blue box. So you're walking down the street, you see this little blue box, you open the lid. It says, if you're feeling lost, hopeless, suicidal, this is for you. If not, leave it for someone else in need. Inside, there's a deck of cards, 52 plus reasons to live, an infographic on depression, a letter, posters, a uh, bracelet, a whole bunch of other good vibes list of resources, and the idea that people can add to it, things that help them or things that were an anchor for them. And 
An anchor just being anything that someone can hold on to for another day or another minute. It doesn't have to be groundbreaking. It can be a smile from a stranger. It can be steak tacos. It can be a lazy Sunday. Literally anything and everything. And the idea is that anchors are everywhere. You just have to start looking. And if you go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> This just gives you kind of an overview, um, a little bit more about what's inside the box. And then if you can go to the next slide, please. So we encourage people to add to the boxes <clears throat> and launch them for others in need. And it's almost like this rite of passage uh, of being grateful to be in a better space and wanting to pay that forward to others. It's, it's something that really started out as my own journey of healing that quickly evolved into something much larger than myself. And I want to talk about a, kind of a second impact that the boxes can have. So Allie speaks about how we will send these boxes directly to individuals who are struggling. They can reach us through um, any of our social media accounts or from our website and just request a box. But we also get this secondary group of people, which are mothers, sisters, cousins, friends. Anybody who knows someone who's struggling can come to us as well and request a box that they themselves can give to those per the people that are struggling. So we find that it's a way to um, cut through the awkwardness of some of these difficult conversations and really acts as a catalyst to have those difficult conversations. Um, next one, please, Sarah. Go ahead. So we apply for a lot of grants um, real quickly on how we work. Um, once I got out of my last hospitalization, I was handed a bill for $14,000 which I call my life tax. And so I've really vowed to make and keep these boxes free for people who are struggling. Uh, financial burden is a huge part of the struggle, and I didn't want that to be another barrier to resources. So our boxes are free for those who are struggling, and the way we support that is through partnerships and those who, um, like professionals, who are able to donate uh, for the boxes. And our partnerships help fund the individuals. Only like one in eight will really donate for the box. And uh, ain't nobody getting paid for this right now. So this is truly like a labor of love and our passion. So <clears throat> we've been applying for a lot of grants. And they always want to know, well, what's your data? Like give us your data, your stats. Like give us, give us numbers. And we keep track of all of that inside of every box. Uh, it's numbered, so we keep track of where every box is sent. But I also have pages and pages of messages like these, you know, saying, I just wanted to let you know that you saved a life today. You know, when I opened the box, I just started crying. You must have saved hundreds of lives by now. And how do you quantify that? You know, is one life saved equal to six ROIs? Like, what's, what's that conversion? And in a way, data takes away the story. One life saved is is enough, you know, of all the work we've done is worth it. So it's just really conveying the impact of these boxes is monumental and, you know, incredibly heartwarming. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. To give you just a little snapshot of kind of how we're growing, um, literally by the day, um, in 2018, we had about 250 boxes in the world. Around this time last year, we had about 1,600 boxes in the world. And as of today, we're at almost 9,000 boxes in the world. Um, and, and again, growing by the day. Uh, we're sending literally hundreds out by the week right now. Um, COVID has really spiked a lot of things, as I'm sure you can imagine, but we are international, we are in every state, uh, we are really, you know, putting our roots into 
St. Clemente and Orange County. I'm not sure if we mentioned we recently moved here from Chicago. Um, so St. Clemente is, is, our, is our home now and just really excited to connect with the community. Um, these numbers are simultaneously exciting and heartbreaking, um, but looking forward to finding ways we can connect. Um, next slide, please, Sarah. Um, and this is this is kind of why we're here. Um, like Ali said, we relocated from Chicago, so we're looking to really put roots down in San Clemente. We're in the midst of opening our office right here in Rancho San Clemente, and we both live in San Clemente. So we really want to kind of dig into the community here, the school district here, all the organizations here, and, and try and, and help in any way that we can. Um, First and foremost, we love partnering with schools and other organizations. Um, we recently um, partnered with Teen Mental Health First Aid, um, which is a national program put on by a National Council for Behavioral Health. And they are in nearly 100 schools across the country, and they've recently just worked um, Find Your Anchor into their curriculum as well. Um, so we actually put on a lot of workshops. Um, so that's one thing that we were discussing as a possibility for working into San Clemente is going into the schools and discussing anchors, discussing um, suicide prevention tactics, and um, doing box assembling workshops. Um, we find it's it's a little bit of a sneaky mental health, which I'll let Allie talk about a little bit more. As as we've worked with uh, teens and even veterans, a lot of people don't necessarily want to admit that they're struggling. So we call our workshops almost like sneaky mental health because it's under the guise of, we know this isn't for you. Uh, you're going to build that you're doing this for someone else. You can launch this box for someone else and help, you know, someone who's struggling. But meanwhile, they're reading everything. They're touching the box. They're digesting. They're, they're consuming, you know, everything about the box. So it's... It's under, you know, we know this isn't for you, but meanwhile, they're they're taking it in. We also um, have, when we partner, we do we can customize the resources. So right now, inside the box, they're kind of national, uh, but when we do specific work with specific communities or schools, we just worked with University of Alabama, and and we did Alabama based mental health resources. So we're super flexible. We can get super creative. Um, and if you go to the next slide, please, Tara. These are just some of the organizations we've worked with. Um, just to kind of show you the, the breadth of you know, depression and suicide doesn't know class. It doesn't know your industry or demographic. It affects everybody. Um, and the way that we normalize these conversations is by doing exactly what we're doing right now. And, you know, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you for allowing us to be part of this, for you creating space for mental health and, and for caring. This is, this is how you normalize mental health, and we are so grateful. And I think last slide, Sarah. And we're basically just here if you have any questions um, or want to know anything else. Welcome to San Clemente. <laughs> oh, nice. So are you have, you're going to have an office in Rancho San Clemente in the industrial park? Is that where you're going exactly, to yep. Mm -hmm. so I'm right up the street or down the street. So that's great. Once you get an address, I'll buy. Wow. Um, good. Thank you very much. How did you find out about us? If you wrote me a letter. Um, I, yeah, I was just looking around on the San Clemente um, government website and saw the committee and thought it was perfect. And I know it had mentioned the possibility of the mental health forum back in May that got pushed. So that kind of uh, piqued my curiosity. Well, great. Well, thank you very much. It's wonderful. Yeah, no, thank you. Glad to see that you're here. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Can, I, can we ask questions or hello? Yeah, absolutely. If there's uh, time, yeah. Hi, this is Bill Ewing. Um, I just um, I want to thank you for all you're doing. This makes a huge difference, and must, you must be very gratified with the kind of work that you do and how your time can really make a difference in somebody's life. I, I see, the question I have is the content of these uh, initial boxes. How do you 
how do you control for age or uh, occupational group or experience level or anything like that? It, not everything goes in. Not everything goes in the same box, I assume. Every everything does go in the same box. Uh, yeah. Although we do have the vet specific boxes now, so those are uh, a little bit different than the others, but they're all the same starting out, and then we encourage people to add to them. So that we cannot control uh, yeah. what's added to them. But the base, the base box, they're all the same. And, and it's geared towards I, it's adults and youth. It's, it's almost what I wish I would have had um, when I was struggling, and it's meant to feel like a conversation with a friend. So with the list of resources at the top, it says, you know, you have in your hand a list of people who want to talk to you. There are people all over the world or the, you know, country, like, waiting to hear from you. You know, fold it up, keep it in your pocket just in case. So it's just meant to feel like someone's kind of with you and gets it. Um, and we've had people, you know, where we've had moms order one for their son and they, she, she took pieces of it and created a scavenger hunt for him to find. We've had other parents to even just leave them on their bed and let them kind of sit with it themselves. Uh, it's, it's really been, people get, get very creative with it, but it's really how it works for you. Yeah, very good. And I would, I would add one, one more thing. It's, it's more of a, or in addition, it's a mental exercise, so finding your anchor means that it can apply to any demographic, any age. So my anchors right now are getting a coffee at Moulin and sitting out on the lawn at Ole. But that might not be yours. It might be surfing. It might be working on your car. So it's really getting you to think through what you enjoy and what brings you happiness in life. And that kind of transcends um, all of the categories. Very good. Thank you. Are you – this will also be a question for Susan. Do the kids who speak Spanish, I mean, they do speak English too, but do, or do you think now that they're in San Clemente, they're going to have to have a Spanish version of this? Or do they speak enough English that they don't need one? I'm, I'm showing my ignorance, but I mean, I'm, that's a question for both of you, for Susan and for Morgan. Um, I, I, we, we put everything in English and Spanish. I don't know if, um, Alex and Morgan, what, what you've thought about doing this. Obviously, if you're in other countries, you're probably in other languages. But what we find here is the kids all speak English, but um, the adults who, who struggle just as much, we have a lot of adults who don't ever really become fluent in English. Well, that's definitely been on our, is on our list. Um, so we can definitely bump that up in priority, but we bit we have, seen a lot of requests coming in for multi-language boxes. Well, it can only get bigger and better, and I'm sure you get a lot of volunteers if you, if you want to start translating some of this stuff. That'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're trying to get creative right now with COVID. We've definitely reached out via, like, next door and had people come and get materials to fold and things at their own homes and bring back to us. Um, but traditionally, we do have, we call them box making parties, where we invite the community in um, to help us make the boxes that we'll then send out. And that's what we do with the schools and things like that, too. It's great for, like, volunteer hours and, and that. But we got to wait for uh, COVID to pass. Just want to say thank you for all you do. This is a really impressive program, and I appreciate you being here and presenting to us today. Yes. Very, very innovative. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. That means a lot. Super. Wow. Okay. Uh, all right. So 5B, which is the, um, the grant recipients, I have two letters here, two emails here I wanted to read to all of you. And then I have one slide, and then we can have our discussion. Um, this letter comes from Jan Montague from San Clemente Village. Uh, it says, good afternoon, Lisa. San Clemente Village is a nonprofit organization that has been in operation since 2016. Our mission is to provide services and programs that help older residents of San Clemente to, re to remain living well in their own homes. Our services such as transportation, non-medical in-home assistance, grocery shopping, pet walking, errands, and friendly phone calls are provided by trained and vetted volunteers. 
During the pandemic, San Clemente Village has continued to provide needed services and social support to our homebound elders. Additionally, we distributed to all of our members fun bags with word games, coloring books, candy, puzzles, etc., and personal safety gear that included face masks, thermometers, hand sanitizers, cleaning wipes, and updated information on the virus. Our expenses have actually increased since the beginning of the pandemic. To our dismay, we recently learned that the community grant funds would not be distributed to nonprofits due to city expenses related to COVID-19. Would it be possible for the nonprofits that did not receive funding to band together under the umbrella of the Human Affairs Committee for a fundraising campaign to area residents, corporations, and other potential sponsors? This could be a great Giving Tuesday fall campaign. Please see my attachment for Giving Tuesday. Funds collected could be distributed to the nonprofits on a percentage basis. And then the second page was a Giving Tuesday. Um, it has a logo. Um, it's a global generosity movement that unleashes the power of people and organizations to transform their communities and their world. Giving Tuesdays was created in 2012 as a simple idea, a day that encourages people to do good. Over the past seven years, this idea has grown into a global movement that inspires hundreds of millions of people to give, collaborate, and celebrate generosity. Giving Tuesday strives to build a world in which the catalytic power of generosity is at the heart of the society we build together, unlocking dignity, opportunity, and equity around the globe. Giving Tuesday's Global Network leverages year-round to inspire generosity around the world with a common mission to build a world where generosity is part of everyday life. I don't know if when, when Giving Tuesday is this year. Does anyone know? Oh, Brenda knows. Yeah, you're on mute. So Giving Tuesday is the first Tuesday after Thanksgiving. It falls, you know, Black Friday is the shopping day for Thanksgiving, you know, for Christmas shopping. And Cyber Monday is the day where everybody shops online. Right. Giving Tuesday is meant to be the antidote to, you know, commercial right. christmas -ing, whatever. Um, and we've participated in it in the last couple of years. My personal feeling about it now is that um, so many nonprofits that are participating in Giving Tuesday um, are all hammering your inbox. Like, it's Giving Tuesday, matching funds, Giving Tuesday, Giving Tuesday. I, I started to feel like I'm now one of a bunch of people who become noise in the consumer's ear. And um, I'm not sure whether or not we want to participate in it again this year because, again, we just become one of an un unending march of emails and in email boxes asking for money one more organization after. And because of the work at my nonprofit, I also am in the mail list of a bunch of other nonprofits. Maybe that's not true for everybody, but I just started to feel a little, I don't know. Um, I, love a can I love the concept. It's a great way to do that. I mean, as far as an idea and uh, for charity, it's, it's a good one. I think so. It just, it, it just kind of become undifferentiated and it just, Part of I think that she her, her idea was to do it as a human affairs committee rather than all these other organizations, and then if whatever would come in to us, then we would give it out. At, at which point, I would say we should do that, but not tie it to Giving Tuesday because it would be again hard to separate that. I, that's a really yeah. I, I like that because that's not for a long time, and we're but that's my feeling on it. I don't know that that's if if, if nobody else feels that way. I mean, I. I know I know I'm not on this committee, but um, I'm exactly I I second what Brenda just said. I, to me, it's become something that we will not participate in anymore. The Giving Tuesday. You can make your own Giving Day any time of the year, right. and um, with the human affairs behind it and pushing it, that could be kind of cool. Oh wow! Okay, I like that. Um, I agree. I think the Giving Tuesday is is too far away, and that was actually one of my comments for the uh, for the grants. Was I was curious if we might be able to do this as a human affairs committee to be able to reach out to um, to the community in one way or another. It could be reaching out to some of the different uh, organizations in town, like Rotary, uh, the Elks Club, the Junior Women's Club, or individuals. Uh, my only question is just us as a human affairs committee. I don't know what uh, what rules we would need to follow to um, to try and create some kind of fundra fundraiser like this. I, I guess we'll find out, um, and then we have a discussion in a, in a minute. The other thing that's coming up that, uh, Susan, you probably know about this too, is the outlet malls decided to go forward with their shopping extravaganza, which ends up being also a big non It's a different uh, uh, model for fundraising, but it's still a bunch of nonprofits 
competing for the same donor dollars in the same small community. Yeah. But that's what that's going on in September in October. Okay. Yeah, I remember that last year. Um, and here's one more letter. This is to me, but it's it's about the funding. It just says it's from Terry Steele of COA. Um, I want to thank you for believing in the COA mission to keep teens and families strong through healthy activities and volunteerism. You've been able to volunteer alongside our team and see firsthand the youth in our community thrive alive because of the ongoing support from the City of San Clemente Human Affairs Committee and City Council. I'm sad to hear that due to budget restraints, no grants are being issued during this time of COVID when more than ever our program is filling the gap. We provide food to families in our community living paycheck to paycheck, and we provide support to activities and education to teens and young adults to curb the abuse of drugs and alcohol. By not receiving a grant, we are basically shutting down the Thrive Alive seven-week program that has helped create a community of teens who have taken the pledge to be community leaders through choosing a life of health. These are all members of our community who need a hand. Parents are struggling more than ever dealing with their teens, and now we can't help them through the parent piece of the Thrive Alive program. COA appreciates all the support from the city from the past years and has built COA Thrive Alive based on that relationship to help raise up a healthy next generation. We're doing our best to keep this going, but losing grant funding at this time is a major hit with so many families in need. Please let me know what we can do to help the city council see the benefits of COA. So I'm, I'm sure we could have seen this, gotten this from every organization. Um, can you bring up that slide that I created, Lisa or Janet? Okay, can I offer something before we go too much further on this? I talked to Cecilia about this as well. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, and it seems to me that th the door is still open for a budget review committee of some kind uh, during the month of August to present the final budget, which I think is going to be accepted in September. I'm not sure, but at the September uh, council meeting. But in any case, I got the idea that there still is some room for no. their changing their mind or reallocating um, uh, money. So. I would like to see us make the statement, I don't want to make a negative statement here, but I don't think we should be in the business of fundraising um, ourselves as a committee, as a committee yeah. boy, that will get us in all kinds of different directions. But I do think that we should be in the business of disagreeing with what the council's action has been um, and just saying that we disagree with it and that we've put a lot of time and effort into encouraging uh, these local organizations to to submit their applications and that we've been involved in evaluating the organizations and how the money is spent and we've been just terrible um, we, we think very badly about the consequences of not getting even some of these smaller amounts uh, for for some of these charities so um, I would just suggest that from our committee, that our chair present a, uh, write a letter to the, uh, the budget, maybe the finance director or the budget services or whoever we need to write the letter to, just kind of disagreeing with their action to see if there's any way that they could uh, reconsider and um, that there's, there's people's livelihoods and uh, benefits to people that are really at stake here. And uh, without getting too mushy about it, I think if we if we go on record saying that we disagree, that might at least get them to to reconsider what they're doing, because that's an awful lot of time on our part that we've taken here too to have it just patently disregarded without any input from us. I tend to agree with Bill on that, um, just in saying that you know our our first order of business would be to try to get the council to overturn their original action to you know defund these social service grants. Um, and and I, I would add to that that, you know, there, there may be certain organizations on this list that don't need the funding or didn't use the funding this year because of COVID-19, um, or perhaps organizations who have been funded by council in another capacity, uh, say community development block grant funding, for example, which may not need the funding from this budget allocation. So um, it seems like there's a little bit of, you know, a little bit of surveying that, that could be done, and I'd be happy to volunteer myself to participate in that 
over the next uh, you know couple of weeks before we submit um, maybe our work plan to council. But I, I agree with Bill. In whatever capacity we reach out to council or the finance director or what have you to um, submit that to to this to be to be heard and, and reviewed by the council, I think that's our our you know first order of business before looking at at other things. Well, I would like to know if if, yeah, if it could be reversed. I didn't know that it was not cast in concrete. I did, I did read a 330-page budget. <laughs> I went through it, and I um, highlighted every page that talked about either social services or nonprofits. But basically, we, went, we were cut by 100%. Uh, they say that we were only cut by 77% because CDBG funds funded FAM and Laura's house, but we don't, that wasn't city money. So it's still 100% of city money did not go to these organizations. Um, and I mean, it, it, I, so what I did was I went and I went and I have all their grants and I went through them and there's some numbers missing here, but there is a section in the grant where you have to say how many people are going to be served and you have to show half years of service and then you have to predict and forecast how many San Clemente residents will be served. So what I did was I just added them all together. I assumed, and that's not a good assumption, but that the best I could do, that only one person would be served by one organization, which is not true because a kid could get some shoes through Operation School Bell and also go to the Boys and Girls Club. It's very likely that they will get one kid would be one of those 300 and also one of those 240. So it's not it's a one-on-one. -on -one, but of the eight, there were 8,800 8, people that would have been served by these organizations, which is 12% of our youth. Are. It's pretty significant. We're, at and, time. Um, we're over time. We're over time? Well. <laughs> so, um, if, if I could make a motion um, that we um, recommend to council as part of our work plan, for 2021 to fund all or part of the social service grants that were scheduled to be funded in the 2021 budget cycle. And in addition, You've got mail. maybe Paula and I can work together to identify which of these organizations um, we recommend to be funded, if not all. Yeah. I'll second that. Second that. Want me to read that again? What, what, what do we just second? Uh, yeah. So the the uh, the motion was to uh, recommend to council to fund all or part of the social service grants scheduled for budgetary cycle 2021, and for Paula, for you and I to work together to identify what the list would be, if not all, uh, what the partial list would be that we recommend, um, and. I don't know what that list is right now, um, but um, I suppose we could ask for the, you know, we don't, need a dollar, we don't need a thousand dollars for grab night t-shirts. That's about the only one that I felt we did. Right, right. Hey, Paula, one one thing: when you look at the the number of people served, fam is yeah. in twenty thousand. I didn't even have fam in there. That's true. Yeah, the date. Oh, so it's not twelve percent. It's huge. Especially now. Okay. Yeah. I second. Uh, all favor? Aye. 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 Um, Paula, this is Cecilia. If I could just um, jump in here real quick. Um, I just wanted to correct um, the comments that um, Bill made earlier that characterized um, our discussion. Um, the, the budget has been passed. Um, what he was referring to is the work program. The work program is 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 in is obviously something that you guys are working on in August. Has to be submitted to the council by September for council consideration and discussion in October. The budget is is done. I understand that you guys want to ask the council to reconsider funding um, the social service grants again. Um, keep in mind that. Um, you know, as staff, we would look at um, these recommendations being provided to the council, not singularly, but with all types of budget-related matters that need additional funding or appropriations. 
um, and that would the appropriate time would be the mid-year budget, uh, which is usually um, in the January February time frame. So I just wanted you to be made aware of that. That um, it. It doesn't make sense from a um, financial standpoint for the city to bring forward to the council to consider adding these to the budget when there could be lots of other requests coming in for other appropriations that the council could consider. So um, I just wanted you to be aware of that, that the appropriate time to make modifications to the budget and to look at additional expenditures or appropriations is the mid-year budget cycle. Thanks. Thank you. Well, um, a couple of other things. Uh, how long are we allowed to have this meeting? This is a, we've been an hour and a half. We're allowed to go to meet for two, right? No, it's till five o'clock. Oh, really? Okay. Because I see that um, Deputy Duran did join, but now I don't see him anymore. Um, I did see him on. Um, I just wanted to say I don't think I don't know. I did not listen to the two and a half hours. I did talk to Laura. She doesn't remember them. Since Specifically telling them that they that all these organizations were not going to get funding. I've read every single page, and there's nothing. It just says called social services. It doesn't name any of these organizations. Um, it just said it says fifty four thousand then zero. It doesn't say what basically what social services are. So it's pretty light on on exactly why we even exist. So. I don't know. I understand that they had a big cut, but everybody got a 10% cut, then, every, then our organization should have had a 10% cut, not a 100% cut. And I don't know whether we, again, I, I'd like to move that we do some kind of a fundraiser, just as human, a human affairs committee fundraiser at some point. I'm not sure how, but we should have our own fundraiser. And I don't know how we're going to do it in COVID, but to get this money back quicker than having to wait till February. I don't want to wait. Then, then, then I would recommend that that be part of your work program that you provide to the city council to request consideration. All right, I will. That will be there. Okay, so that will be part of our plan. And I, I can't recall exactly what the verbiage was of my motion that we just passed, but I think it, it, it the intention of that motion was for it to be included in our work plan, and uh, and so we could we could incorporate that into what we submit to the council in September, and uh, and. I totally understand what Cecilia is saying about the council not looking at items individually and staff bringing them items individually, but uh, obviously the, the social service grant funding approval is something that's pretty core to the Human Affairs Committee's purpose, and and so I, I think it's within our charge to bring this specifically to the council, and so yeah, can, I would look for that. Yeah, we can do it uh, mid-year, make it a, a project to do mid-year. Yeah, you know, when she said like uh, the January, February, they readdressed. Oh, the well, that, yeah, but we, 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 I don't know how we're going to do anything until then. I don't know. Um, I just keep the year and keep going. So if, the, so if the council reviews this as part of our work plan that they look at in September or October, whenever it is, um, that'll be written as part of our work plan that we're requesting the 2021 social service grants be funded in all or part. And and they'll, you know, if they look into it and review it specifically, they'll they'll have a dis hopefully have a discussion about that, and we can obviously follow up with council members individually in advance. Um, I think it's I think it's super important. Um, just wanted to add a comment that, you know, the the small amount of funding that we provide to these organizations in the community has an exponential impact on the community uh, relative to the cost. So. I don't think that this should go down without a fight. I don't think that we should be cutting this funding in total, maybe in part um, based on need, but I think this is something we should definitely follow through with and incorporate into our work plan. Yeah, I have the pages printed that um, of the 330. I mean, it was sent to me by Tyler, but you can't even send it. Even when you zip it, it's 400, it's 46 meg. You can't even send it around. So. Um, I, what I can do is I can find, you know, relevant pages of just, but I don't know what, whether we should be complaining. I mean, I can go through this budget and I can find places to find money, but I don't want to complain. I just want to solve the problem. So I don't know whether going through the budget is going to help. It's, yeah, and it's not a matter of complaining. I think staff has, a, has a, a need to fill a lot of information into a budget, and even within a 300-page budget, it's, it's not possible to factor in everything, and I think that's, that's just the challenge of presenting such a, 
such a large and complex budget to a council. And so it's not, it's not anybody's fault or anything. It's just we're, we've found this need. And so I think we're just acting on that, that need in the community. I, I agree with Tyler. I think it's just a matter of us as the Human Affairs Committee bringing to the Council's attention the importance this funding has for the community. Now, if they decide, if they decide not to fund it, they decide not to fund it because they have final choice. But I think we as a committee, uh, it's kind of our role to bring it to their attention, the importance of these funds and how little these funds are compared to the overall budget, and then let them decide what they're going to decide. Yeah, let's advocate. That's good. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. yeah. I agree. I mean, to say nothing is to agree. Even if the even if we can't change it, we need to voice our yeah. um, our concern and the inappropriateness of the decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Our, it says it's uh, City of San Clemente in partnership with the community we serve will foster a tradition dedicated to maintaining a healthy atmosphere in which to live, work, and play guiding development to ensure responsible growth while preserving and enhancing our village character, unique environment, and natural amenities, providing for the city's long-term stability from promoting the economic vitality and diversity, resulting in a balanced community committed to protecting what is valued today while meeting tomorrow's needs. I mean, that's what this is. This is grassroots stuff to help the whole community. Excuse me, this is Janet, and we're over time, so we need to, to wrap it up. Um, I Sorry. think that is. There it is. Yeah, I got it. Okay, high school student award. Um, Toby and I will discuss that, and with Susan, we'll try to see what we can do if anything. Um, and we will leave them alone until they get their act together. That's definitely fair. Um, okay, one more thing. I was going to have a top education topic for October. I was thinking senior issues. I don't know now what it should be. Almost like coronavirus impact assessment because we have no idea what's going to be going on in two months from now. So um, I will just wait on what the education topic will be um, for another month or so. I think that should be okay with everybody. Okay. Okay. So we are we are done. So I'd like a motion for the meeting to adjourn. Make a motion to close during the meeting. Second. Okay, guys. We'll, we'll hear, you'll be hearing from me. <laughs> hey, thank you. Your email boxes. Tyler, did you get my response to your text? Uh, I will have to look it up. <laughs>